All right. Thank you, uh, guys, and Ashley for helping us with our music. Uh, If you have a Bible, turn to Ephesians chapter 1. A Bible or a Bible app? I still don't consider a Bible app a Bible. I'm sorry. I just, I can't get there. But um, uh, if that's what you're using, great. I'm glad you're using it. (laughs) Don't be offended by what I just said. (laughs) Old school in a lot of ways. All right, Ephesians chapter 1, we find ourselves in the second chapter uh, this morning, beginning the second chapter, and some of you have been reading, uh, I know you have been, through the week, and that's good, I'm glad you do, and that brings you more prepared, you're already thinking, you've already got questions, you've already got um, understanding, perceptions in your mind, and and that's good. The more we have of that, uh, the more the Holy Spirit has to work with, so you keep that up, and hopefully I can fill in some holes for us all this morning. So let me read uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through, um, verses one through 5. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Paul writes this, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the son who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves, In the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. What a passage. Let's pray. Father, Uh, Thank you again for bringing us here this morning. Thank you for music that uh, gives us truth and gives us ways to express truth to you. Um, You are our audience. We're not singing for the entertainment of one another. Uh, We are singing to you. You are our audience, and we are expressing what love is. It is is what you are. It's what you have done through your son, Jesus Christ. And so even the music this morning ties together with Paul's theme in this letter— that this is all to the praise of the glory of your grace. That's what we want to come to you. We want to enjoy giving that to you. So I pray that you'll use these five verses this morning to to bring us to to that end, our joy over your grace, your glory through our joy over your grace. Help me as I teach. I pray that these words will be clear and simple and straightforward, No, not making anything more confusing, but maybe... Um, helping, helping someone to be less confused by these uh, verses and thrilled over you and your son Jesus Christ and grace, your, your blessings, um, the extent of this particular blessing. I pray for all of your people who are here this morning that uh, th- this will just excite us in a way that is permanent, uh, a way that gives us a, a newfound appreciation for, for how we got to be who we are and what we are. So make that happen. And I pray that if there are any among us this morning that um, do not yet know you, they have not yet been drawn to Christ, they have not yet received this blessing that we're going to talk about this morning, that maybe this morning is is the time that you give that to them. You're the one who does. You're the only one who can. So I pray that you would do that for their sake, but for yours as well, as you create one more new worshiper. Father, I pray all of these things in the name of our beloved Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So, how much evangelism have you done? Some of you have been Christians for a lot of years, a lot of years, decades and decades and decades. How much evangelism have you done during that time? And I mean, it could be personal, private evangelism, you just one-on-one with somebody, a family member, a friend, just talking gospel with them, or it may have been as part of some organized evangelistic effort, maybe like our pantry on Saturday morning, or maybe you've done door-to-door evangelism on Thursday night's visitation with your church down through the years. Uh, it could, any, any form, any method of evangelism is what I'm talking about. And my question is, how much success have you had in your evangelistic efforts through the years? Now, I guess that depends on how we define success, right? So we've got to be careful with that question. But what I'm, what I'm talking about is how many people have believed what you've told them to the point that they trusted in Jesus as their Savior and Lord? How often has that happened? 
How many times have you witnessed that or, or and been able to experience that down through all the years and all the times that you have practiced evangelism? Probably not many, right? Sad to say, but it's just true. Probably not many. And the answer is, or the question is, why not? Why is that true? Why is that often, why is that usually the case that you share the gospel, but they don't believe, they aren't changed, nothing really happens as a result of your evangelistic efforts? Why do they rarely trust in Christ after we share the gospel with them? There's a lot of ways to answer that question. We can answer it on a horizontal level, we can answer it from a human perspective, and I know that many times after I've shared the gospel with someone, I come away thinking, well, I didn't make it that clear enough for anybody to understand it. You know, if I had to rely on what I just said to understand the basic facts of the gospel, I'd I'd be lost too. You ever feel that way? Or maybe it's because we come away from sharing the gospel with someone sometimes and we think, I wasn't passionate at all. Why should I expect them to have a sense of urgency in what I'm saying when there's no sense of urgency coming from me when I say it? You ever feel that way when, when you try to share the gospel with someone? There's also the sad fact that most people, at least here in the South, most people that we share the gospel with think they're basically a good person. So why would God ever be angry with me? Why should I have to worry about eternal condemnation or damnation when I'm basically a good person? Certainly God's going to welcome me someday. That's the idea. That's the mindset that most people have. And then there are are others that you will meet who are very, very honest, and they've come to the conclusion that they're too bad for God to save. There's no sense in them believing or trusting in Christ because he won't have them anyway because they've been so bad through their lifetime. All of those are good human perspective answers. I mean, those are all possibly factors when someone doesn't follow your gospel message to trust in Jesus Christ. But if we want to know the real reason, the, 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 the one true answer to that question, if we want to know the, the one factor that is always present and always in control, that always keeps the lost from following Christ in faith, Paul's going to give it to us here. And if we are believers, if we did at some point follow someone's gospel message to faith in Jesus Christ, then we need to understand how that happened. And Paul's giving us that here too, okay? So, very quickly, remember where we've come from. In the last part of chapter 1, we followed Paul on what just seems like a short detour. He had been giving a list of the Father's blessings to all of his people, all who are saints. Let me put them up here on the screen for you again, just to remind you of what we've seen already. This ties back to chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Then he lists some of those spiritual blessings. It included election, adoption, redemption, illumination. I ought to get you to finish the rest of the list, right? I won't do that to you this morning. That inheritance that we have with Christ, faith, and then sealing he talked about in verses 13 and 14 of chapter 1. He gave us that list, one after another after another, and then he kind of broke off to tell these Ephesian saints how much those blessings made him pray for them. And so he told them how he prayed because of those blessings that had been given to them by the Father. When we get to chapter 2, verse 1, we are picking, off, picking up where Paul left off. Okay? That's why verse, two, verse 1 of chapter 2 starts with and in most of our translations. And is a connector. You know, you've got this and you've got this. There's it's two things, not just one thing. And so chapter 2, verse 1, and is reaching back to what has come before, and it's connecting. Paul is is picking up and going forward. Now, our tendency is just to look back to the verse that came before and think, well, he's just now adding on to verses 22 and 23 that we saw last week. That's not what's happening here. Paul is reaching back further. He's going all the way back to verse 13, actually, of chapter 1, where he said, "...in in Christ you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise." 
He finishes his thought in verse 14. Then he goes on that rabbit trail for a few verses. Now you come back to chapter 2 and verse 1, and he's picking up where he left off in verse 13. He's basically saying, the Father sealed you with the Holy Spirit, and he did this to you that I'm going to tell you about next. Okay? Now, in verse 1 of chapter 2, we who have New King James or King James, it says in our translation... You, he made alive. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands to to find out how many have that in your translation. I know others of you who have other translations, and that doesn't exist. New King James, King James, and you, he made alive. But if you have that, you recognize that those words are in italics, right? What does that tell us? It means Paul didn't originally write those words. Those words were added by the translators of the King James and the New King James with all the best intentions. They they were trying to make Paul's thoughts, Paul's intention here, even more clear to us by adding those words. Okay. Now, the thing is, he's going to outright say it over in verse 5 again. Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. No italics there, right? He did write it in verse 5, and and he'll get to that eventually, but he didn't write it in verse 1. And I think this is one of the few places that it hurts in what the translators have added and what they've tried to do. Because Paul is not just right, right away saying, the Father sealed you with his Holy Spirit and he made you alive. He's not getting to it that quickly. Paul has another purpose before he gets to that blessing of the Father. He wants to tell why the blessing was necessary before he tells what the blessing actually is. So literally what Paul wrote in verse 1 is, God sealed you, and when you were in this condition, God blessed you this way too. He wants to talk about that condition first. And he builds this entire lesson about their former condition, when God made them alive, he builds it all on one mammoth word that you find in verse 1. What's that word? You he made alive who were, what? Dead. Dead. Underline it, circle it, color it, put arrows all around it, exclamation points, whatever you need to do to hone in on that word in this section. That's the word. Everything else he's going to say after this is just building on that. It's an explanation of that. It's an illustration of that, okay? Now, I love being a pastor. Uh, you know, I've loved it for 22 years, and there are parts of it that, that I love dearly. I love this part of it. love preaching. Like Kevin, loves teaching. I love teaching, too. We love studying to prepare to preach and teach to all of you. We love being with God's people. That's, that's, that's a joy when you're a pastor. And, and I love watching you grow in grace and knowledge. I like watching you individually and as couples and families making decisions based on what you've learned about Christ, making decisions saying, okay, we're going to live our life this way because of that. Pastors, eat that up. I I love that part of being a pastor. I love singing with you like we just did. I love praying with you like we're going to do tonight at 6 o'clock. I love serving people with you, and I love watching you serve one another. But there is a part of pastoring that is not fun at all. Now, the wheels in your brain are spinning, aren't they? Trying to figure out, what's he going to say? What is it? I don't want to do that. Or maybe I do want to do that. Um, What is it? Well, I've had to be around a lot of death over the last 22 years. And I don't just mean preaching a lot of funerals. That's not exactly what I'm talking about here. But I've been with a lot of people as they were dying and even been around quite a few dead bodies after they did die. And that repeated experience, and I don't know exactly how many times it's happened, but it's been quite a few, and that repeated experience has made something crystal clear to me, as if I didn't know it already. This actually solidified it in my mind. I've touched some of those dead bodies. I've talked to those dead bodies. I've prayed over those dead bodies. I've been with people as we sang around those dead bodies. And guess what? Not a one of them moved in response. Not one. 
You can ask questions to a dead body. You can give orders to a dead body. You can talk more loudly to the dead body. You can get in the face of the dead body and scream or or yell. You can shake them. You can pinch them. You can tickle them. And what will they do? Nothing. Not a thing. They can't do anything. Why? Because they're dead. Simple answer, right? This, This seems like, you know, kindergarten spiritual lesson here, but it's very important. There's no life in that dead body anymore. The brain isn't firing, the heart isn't pumping, blood is not flowing through the body anymore, so that body can't do anything physically. That's the picture that Paul is trying to put into the minds of these Ephesian saints by saying, you were dead. He wants them thinking that way. He he wants that kind of a mental picture to, to, to come up in their mind and stick there and really make an impression on them. You were dead. Now, he's not talking physically, right? He's writing a letter to these people, expecting these people to read the letter, which requires what? It requires them to be alive physically, to be able to read the letter and respond to the letter. He's not talking physically. He's talking about spiritual death. He could have said, you were spiritually dead. That had been their condition. Not just one day of their life, not just a moment in time. This is not like when, when, when somebody stops breathing, their heart stops beating, and you know, the doctors put the paddles on them and shock them, and their heart starts beating again. So they were momentarily physically dead, I guess you could say. That's not what he's saying here. When he says, you were dead... He is talking about what they were constantly. This was their state of being. This is what they had been all along and still were when God gave them this next blessing. You were spiritually dead. But what does that mean? Does it mean just like physical death that they had no spiritual life? Is that what Paul's saying here? Is Paul saying they couldn't do anything spiritually? Is that what he's saying here? And the answer is, yes, that's what he's saying here, definitely. But that's kind of where the parallel between physical death and spiritual death ends. There is a similarity. A physically dead person can't do anything. Spiritually dead person can't do anything either spiritually. But but at that point there starts to be a difference in the way you recognize death, okay? Unlike physical death, spiritual death manifests itself in what that spiritually dead person is doing. Now, now follow me on this, okay? Because it's very, very important. You know someone is physically dead because he's not doing anything, right? He's not walking He's not talking, he's not breathing, he's not feeling, he's not moving physically. He's dead. We know that for a fact because because of what he's not doing. But spiritual death is just the opposite. How do you spot someone who's spiritually dead? You spot spiritual death by how a person is thinking and is feeling and is acting. The mark of spiritual death is the life the person is living. You follow that? So you got to start out thinking physically to get the concept in your mind, but at a certain point you stop thinking physically because it's a little different in the spiritual realm. And Paul's going to use the rest of these first three verses to illustrate that spiritual death through the past lives of these people. And what he's going to say about these people is true of everyone who is a saint today. At one point in time, this was our biography too. At one point in time, this is exactly what we looked like and felt like and thought like and and acted like, okay? But he's going to explain it. What does spiritual death actually look like when someone is spiritually dead, okay? So I want you to notice the actions that he points out in these next three verses, starting in verse 2. Look at the language, or verse 1. You he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Stop right there. So let me reorganize it so you understand what he's saying. Paul said, you once walked in the realm of trespasses and sins. You were spiritually dead and you walked 
you lived in trespasses and sins. That was the realm where you lived. Okay? Spiritual death lives in that realm, acts, walks in that realm. Now, if we say someone lives in the physical realm, what are we saying? We mean that everything in that realm is physical. It's material. It's identifiable by the senses. You can touch it. You can hear it. You can, you can smell it. You can taste it. It's a physical realm. If, if someone lives in the physical realm, that person is a physical being. They live in a physical universe. We live on a physical planet occupied by other physical beings, right? Other human beings, animals, plants. Those are all physical beings. And someone who lives in a physical realm does physical things. We sit on a physical pew. We open physical hymn books. We sing physically. We drive a car to get here physically. Tonight, we will look up in the sky and physically look at stars in the sky if there's no clouds out there. We swim. We eat. Understand? That's a physical realm. And so everyone that lives in that realm, everything that lives in that realm, is, is physical. Okay? Surrounded by physical things, you are a physical thing in the physical realm. Okay? Now, Paul said the realm that these people lived in was not the physical realm. That's not what he's talking about. He says it is the realm of trespasses and sins. That's what the little word in, in trespasses and sins, in means within the realm of trespasses and sins. Physical realm, realm of trespasses and sins. That's where they lived. That's what they were surrounded by. That's what they were a part of. That's what characterized them. That's what they did. Trespasses and sins. Now, what do those two words mean? We've seen both of those in Scripture just countless times. In fact, the word sin that Paul uses here in verse 1 is, is the most popular word for what he's talking about. It's sin. You see it all over Scripture, especially in Paul's letters. This is the word that means to miss the mark. Sins, to miss the mark. So picture having a bow and an arrow, and there's a target out there, and you let go of the arrow trying to shoot the target, and you miss the bullseye, or you miss the target altogether. That's what sin is in a spiritual sense, okay? So this is not getting things right spiritually. Sin is desiring, thinking, speaking, doing the wrong things. Now, someone can be trying to do the right thing and still end up doing the wrong thing. That would be in the category of sins. You you might make a good effort, but that's not God's will. You, You might think you're headed the right way, but that's contrary to God's law. That's what sin is. And most everyone that you talk to will admit to this at some point in their life, right? Nobody's perfect. Everybody makes mistakes, and, and a sin could be a mistake. You end up doing the wrong thing when you were trying to do the right thing. It's not just that unintentional thing, but it would include unintentional sins. And that's what Paul says, you lived in the realm of that. Others around you were sinning, you were sinning. You were all falling short of the glory of God, which is what? It's his holiness, it's purity, it's, it's righteousness, All human beings, these saints that Paul's writing to, Paul himself, you and me, we don't measure up to the standard of perfection and holiness and purity, which is God and which comes from God and what God requires. That's what sin is. That's what these people did because that's where they lived. That's what they were. They were sinners, okay? But there's another word that he used. He could have stopped with just sins, but he added to it, which tells me He does intend a difference in these two words. There is a slight difference between sins and trespasses. What's a trespass? A trespass is to fall by the side of something. So you're on a very narrow pathway and you fall off the side of it, or it can mean to step off the side of it. So one might be unintentional. The other is intentional. I I made a decision to step off the side of that pathway. And I think here, that's what Paul has in mind. This is not an accidental falling by the side of what is right. This is something that is very deliberate. These are acts of rebellion. Knowing what is right and choosing not to do it. Choosing to do the opposite. Trespasses are conscious, willful transgressions 
Again, knowing what's right. I, I see the pathway. I know what the pathway is. That's where I should stay. Now, nah, I'm going to step off over here. I'm going to go through the woods because I think I've got a quicker way and an easier way to get there. These are trespasses, okay? Very interesting that Paul used this very same word over in Romans chapter 11 where Paul was talking about how sad he was that, that Israel had fallen. And he, when he talked about Israel's fall, this was the word that he used, trespass. And in that first section of verses in Romans chapter 11, he looks back to the time of Elijah when God's people Israel knew exactly how God felt about idolatry. That was not unclear at all. He had stated in it his law. He had sent his prophets to make it clear. He had punished Israel how many times for their idolatry. And yet, the people in Elijah's day did what? They followed every one of their kings to keep committing idolatry. We're talking about this on Wednesday night right now. Trespass. Not Oh, we, we unintentionally made a mistake. No one's perfect. No, not that at all. It is willful. It is conscious. It is deliberate. It is intentional. On purpose, I say no to God. That's what Paul is saying about these Ephesian saints. Before they were saints, that's the realm they lived in. They were surrounded by deliberate disobedience to God, and not just surrounded by it, they participated in it too. That's what they did because that's what, where they lived. That's what they were, okay? The realm in which they lived was this realm of trespasses. Now, you might be thinking, well, wait a second. This, this, this church in Ephesus was largely Gentile. The Gentiles didn't have the Mosaic law. So how can you, how can you accuse someone of deliberate, willful disobedience to God when they didn't even have the standard by which God is judging people. That's not really fair, right? It's a fair argument. Okay, it is a fair argument. But Paul dealt with that argument in Romans chapter 1, didn't he? Anybody. And in Romans chapter 1, he's talking about Gentiles. Gentiles, people who have never had the word of God at all. They don't have the law that, that God put on his people Israel. You go outside and you look around you. You see the things that God made. And looking at the things God made, what can you tell? that God exists. There is a divine, omnipotent being. There's no other explanation for how all, all this stuff got here. And that divine, omnipotent being deserves, even demands, to be worshipped, praised, thanked, served. You see that through the things that God has had made, and Paul said, so that they are without excuse. No one will ever stand before God someday and say, I didn't know you existed. I didn't know you, what you wanted of me. God has made his basic general law very clear through creation. And that's why Paul can say to these Ephesians, okay, you weren't, you weren't a Jew, you didn't have the Mosaic law, but guess what? You were still guilty of trespasses because that's the realm you lived in. Everybody committed trespasses against God in that basic way, if not by breaking God's Mosaic law itself. So this is what spiritual death looks like. This is where every man lives. This is what every man is, a sinner and a trespasser. That's what has defined all of mankind ever since Adam committed the very first trespass. Did Adam know what he was doing? Absolutely. It had been made very clear to him, and he made a willful choice to disobey God. All of his descendants have lived in the realm of sins and trespasses ever since then. That's spiritual death. That's this realm. You know, when someone's spiritual dead, spiritually dead, you will see them living in that realm, walking, acting, committing trespasses, because that's the realm where they live. Okay? But Paul doesn't stop explaining this with that statement in verses 1 and 2. In verse 2, he goes further to explain what this looks like. Listen to me read it. In which you once walked, in those trespasses and sins, you once walked, but you were also walking according to the course of this world. You walked, you lived according to the course of this world. Now, we've seen that little word, course, very recently. Last week, back up in verse 21, where Paul was talking about... Um, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but in that which is to come. That word age is the same word that he uses down here that's translated as 
course in a lot of our translations. We talked about last week what that word age means. It's a time period. It's got a beginning. It's got an end. It's defined by something. There's, there's a mark that stands out about that period of time. Okay? Well, what is Paul saying here? What, what characterizes this period of time? Well, he said it is marked by this world. It's the course of this world. It's the age of this world. And he's not talking about the the, the physical planet that we live on, the world. It's not what he's talking about. He is talking about the humanity that lives during that time period. You lived in a way that was consistent with humanity during this time period. Well, what are they like? What makes humanity during this time period tick? What are they after? Remember a couple of the things John said about the world when when he spoke about the world? He said, Satan is the ruler of this world. He also said the whole world lies under the sway of whom? The wicked one, Satan, the evil one, right? So that would suggest, John suggests, that the world does what Satan wants them to do. The world, this mass of humanity during this time period, does what Satan does himself. And that is exactly what Paul is saying, too, when he tells these, these saints that they were spiritually dead. He says, you walked according to this age of this world, the, the, the course of this mass of humanity. You walked according to. To them, And he's going to use the same language in his next phrase when he says, according to someone else. So he repeats that little phrase, according to. And the little Greek preposition that is translated according to is talking about movement downward towards something or downward onto something. You lived according to the course of. The, the, the humanity that lives during this time period. Oh, okay, what does that mean, down toward or down onto? Well, let me illustrate it this way. Some of you have met my brother. He, he visited here just a, uh, a month or so ago. And you can't tell this now, but he was, he's four and a half years older than I am. And so we would wrestle as kids. That's what brothers do, right? He's four and a half years older than me. So when I'm seven, when I'm eight years old, He's almost a teenager, and there were times when my brother was 30, 40 pounds heavier than me, and we would get in wrestling matches down in the basement. Always ended up the same way, in a real fight. But one of the reasons it would end up in a real fight is because a lot of the times, my brother would just lie on top of me. Just lay down on top of me, all his body weight on top of me, and what could I do? Nothing. I couldn't wrestle anymore. I couldn't get him in a hold. I couldn't hurt him. I couldn't even get up and run away. I was at his mercy. I did exactly what he wanted me to do. And, oh, gosh, I hated that. Like, oh, you cannot imagine. But, but I had to do exactly what he wanted me to do because he put all of his weight down on top of me. Okay? That's a pretty good illustration for this little preposition that Paul keeps using repeatedly to describe what spiritual death is. That's what this world, run by Satan, was doing to these saints when they were spiritually dead. The world exerted their influence down upon these future saints so that these people did what the world did. These people did what was consistent with the world, just like the world, copy, carbon copies of the world. These people acted the way the world wanted them to live, which was how the ruler of the world was swaying them all to live. And isn't that exactly what Paul goes on to say next in verse 2? You once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. It's exactly what Paul is saying. What, what John suggested, the whole world lies under the sway of the, the wicked one. Paul is saying the same thing here. You did what the world did. You did what the world told you to do. You did what the world wanted you to do. The way you lived was perfectly consistent with the rest of the world. Why? 
because the prince of the power of the air is putting all of his weight down on top of the world. He's exerting his influence down on all people who are not indwelt by the Holy Spirit and changed and sealed by the Holy Spirit. The, whole, the, the, the prince of the power of the air is doing that. And we know who the prince of the power of the air is, right? I mean, we've talked about this um, last week also when back in verse 21, he's talking about principality and power and might and dominion. And we talked about that spiritual realm where Satan rules and he's got an organized hierarchy of demons under him and he, he gives orders and they give orders and demons are sent out into the world, into the, to the air, the unseen atmosphere around all of us. And that's where Satan exerts his authority. That's where he carries out his power to influence human beings from that unseen realm. So his rulers of darkness, his hosts of wickedness, his demons influence thoughts and they control actions of people in this world. And what does Satan make people do with that power and authority? Well, Paul answers that question, too, right at the end of verse 2. He calls him the spirit who now works in the sons of what? Disobedience. Disobedience. Remember when Jesus told the religious rulers, you are sons of your father, the devil, and you do what your father wants you to do. You do what your father does, actually. Paul's taking the same approach here by talking about sons of disobedience. The people of the world, people before they become saints, people before they receive this blessing that we're going to talk about in a second, they are sons of disobedience. Disobedience is like their father, like their parent, so they do what their father does, which is disobey. They disobey God. And Paul goes even further in verse 3 to expose what that disobedience looks like. Look at verse 3. He says, Among whom, among those sons of disobedience, we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. That's a big statement. But when we boil it all down, what is Paul saying? Rather than obey God, what did they obey? Their flesh. Supposed to obey God, but instead they conduct themselves in the lusts of their flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Supposed to obey God, but instead they obey the flesh. And we know what Paul has to say about the flesh, right? When he's talking to the church at Galatia, he said the the flesh lusts against the spirit. The spirit has cravings. The spirit inside of his people causes his people to crave certain things. But at the same time, the flesh is craving certain things too, and they're not the same. They're the exact opposite. They're in opposition to each other. They are contrary to one another. If the the spirit is, is lusting for something in that direction, the flesh is lusting for something in the exact opposite direction. The spirit leads for the glory of Christ and the good of others. And he leads for those ends by pushing people to serve one another, to love one another. Well, what does the flesh do? The flesh lusts for the good and the glory of self and tries to get that by service of self. You see, they're completely the opposite. They don't want the same thing, and they don't go about things the same way. They're going in opposite directions. The flesh wants what will feel good. That might be physically That might be emotionally, but it wants what will feel good, and it wants to feel good right now. No matter whether what it wants is right or not, and no matter whether it has to use people or even hurt people to get that pleasure for itself. That's the flesh. Even when the flesh does something that seems to be good for someone else, there is a self-serving pleasure-seeking motive behind it in some way. And what Paul is saying is, that's what spiritual death looks like. That's what it looked like in the lives of these people when God came to bless them. And Paul is now even including himself in this picture. Remember in verse 3, he said, among whom we all once conducted ourselves this way. 
He's not just pointing the finger at these Ephesian saints saying, before God blessed you, you were terrible. I mean, you were in a class all by yourself. I can't, I can't even imagine how, how wicked you were. No, Paul is saying, we all live this way. We are all guilty of this. We all, instead of obeying God, we obeyed our flesh. Whatever the flesh wanted and whatever our minds told us to do, whatever our mind came up with, whatever plan our mind concocted to give the flesh what it wanted, that's what we followed. That's what we served. You people, yep, but me too is what Paul said. That's what spiritual death looks like. All who are spiritually dead do what the flesh wants as their pattern of life, not what God wants and what God commands. They pursue what the flesh craves. They carry out what the mind designs. And we could be here all day long thinking up illustrations of this. This is where addictions come from. Somebody wants pleasure in a particular way right now. The mind comes up with a way to get that pleasure and get as much of it as often and and, and for as long as it possibly can. It's where addictions come from. This is where affairs begin. A husband or a spouse comes up with the idea that they want pleasure in another way. The mind says, oh, you can get it from him or you can get it through her. And suddenly you have an affair and you end up with a divorce. This is where people get an extreme debt. Oh, I I want this object. I've got to have it. I can't afford it, but I can get a credit card and buy it on the credit card, even though I can't afford to make the payments on the credit card. And before you know it, they're swimming in debt because they didn't just do it once. They did it five times. They did it ten times, and they can't get out of debt at that point in time. This is where hoarding comes from. You ever watch those shows on TV where people are hoarders? I know sometimes there's there's a mental illness going on there. But behind it, underneath it, is this very thing. The flesh says, I've got to have that item, even though I've got 15 of that item already. Even though I don't use any of those items, if I get one more, then I'll be happy. What happens? Not happy. So I've got to go get another one. And before you know it, you can't walk through the house because the flesh has pushed the mind to work that way so long and so often that now you're a hoarder and you're on television. Yeah, we could go on with this over and over and over again. This is spiritual death. This is one of the marks of spiritual death. What if the spiritually dead can't get what they want? Well, look at the end of verse 3. So you want this, you come up with a way in your mind to get this, but it doesn't happen. The end of verse 3, Paul says, And we all were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. I was just like you, you were just like me. We're all just like the other sons of obedience who are out there right now. Flesh wants this. The flesh craves this. The flesh can't stop thinking about this. And so the flesh moves the mind to come up with a way to get it. Oh, if I just take this step and that step and use this person, and even if I have to hurt that person, I'll end up getting what I want, and then I'll be happy. I'll have the pleasure, the the feeling that I want, or the, the, the emotional feeling that I want, or the recognition that I have to have, or the admiration that I want. I can get it this way. But somebody stands in your way, and you don't end up getting it. What's the response? We are children of wrath, just like everybody else. Just like sons of disobedience are children whose parent is disobedient, so they, disobedient, so they act just like the parent. Paul's using the same approach here. Children of wrath have what as their parent? Wrath. So what do they do? They act just like their parent. They get angry when they don't get what they want, And they have to carry out that anger towards someone. It might be the person who stood in their way. Or it could be someone who is innocent in the whole thing. You know, uh, know, I had this plan today to get what I wanted and I didn't get it. And I'm so ticked off. And I come home and I take it out on my family. You know, I've just got this terrible mood and I'm I'm snappy at my kids. and, And I beat my kid when they didn't even do anything wrong. It's not about them. It's about my flesh not getting what it wants, and I'm full of wrath, and I take that out on someone else. Or they will take it out on God himself. Blame God, curse God, deny God what he deserves and what he wants. They are children of wrath. We have a new grandbaby now. 
to two-week-old baby granddaughter, guess what? When she doesn't get food when she wants it, what's she do? She pitches a fit, not cry. Don't make it sound better than it is, Pat. She pitches a fit. Did Josh and Lauren have to teach her to pitch that fit? Comes naturally. We were by nature children of wrath. That's the nature that goes along with spiritual death. I want what I want because it'll make me feel good. When I don't get it, I'm going to pitch a fit. I'm going to have a temper tantrum. Babies do it and grow into adults who do it as well. That's what spiritual death looks like, okay? This is the condition of all who are spiritually dead. Paul says, Ephesians saints, this was your condition at one time. Paul says, this was my condition at one time. We were sinning. We were trespassing. We were deliberately disobeying God's law. We were ignoring God and what he deserves and what he demands, not just once in a while, but as our way of life, because that's the realm that we all lived in. That's what we were, not just where we were, what we were. So that's what we did. We were dominated by this godless world. We were dominated by Satan himself. We were serving our fleshly desires, and then we would lash out when we couldn't get what we wanted. That's how spiritual death manifests itself, okay? Physically dead person, you know it's dead because it's not doing anything physically. But someone who is spiritually dead is doing a lot of things, which is just showing that he or she is spiritually dead. What a bleak condition, right? How, how awful does that sound? How, how dark of a condition is that? Spiritually dead. No ability to do what is spiritually right. No holiness, just godlessness. Again, this was these Ephesian saints at one time. This was Paul at one time. And if you are here this morning as a saint, this was you at one time. This was me at one time as well. Now, why go to such lengths to paint such a terrible picture? I mean, Paul could have just said, you were lost. Paul could have said, you were unsaved. We use those terms today, don't we? Paul could have just said, you you were a sinner. And maybe that would have made a point, but it wouldn't have made the point Paul wanted to make here. And it wouldn't have set up what's coming next. You know, you only see how white something is when you put it against what? Black. You know, Steve's got on a black, I think it's black. Steve's got on a black shirt right now. If one of you with a a white shirt goes and sits down right next to Steve, Ashley's got on a black and white blouse, so you can see the contrast very well there. If you put if you put white against yellow, it doesn't stand out quite so much. If you put it against tan, it doesn't stand out so much. But if you set it right next to something that is pitch black, you see how white something is. Paul has just given us a pitch black backdrop. Why? Because he wants us to see how white something is. And that's why you get to verse 4 in those first two words that We've, we've honed in on so many times in the past, and when I, when I read them out loud a little bit, I, I heard a little bit of a, a reaction out of you, but the first two, verse, verse, first two words in verse 4 are, but God. But God doesn't mean as much if verses 1 through 3 are just, you were sinners, you were lost, you were unsaved. But God means a whole lot more when you read everything that he just wrote in verses 1 through 3. When he just said, you were dead, not partly dead, not mostly dead, you were dead, and here's what it looked like. This is how you acted, and this is why you acted the way you did. I mean, you were owned by this unbelieving, lost, godless world because this godless world is under the sway of the prince of the power of the air himself, Satan himself, and you were so bad off that everything your flesh craved, you came up with a way in your mind to get it, and that's what you served. Not serving God, that's what you served. Even when you knew what God deserved from you, even when you knew what God demanded of you, you were doing the opposite on purpose. That's how bad spiritually dead is. 
That's how ugly spiritual death is. That's how black the condition is. And then verse 4, but God. Means more, doesn't it? But God. And literally Paul says, but the God. There's a definite article there. But the God. And Paul's talking to a bunch of people who used to be steeped in idolatry. Whether they followed the, the, the Greek gods and goddesses or the Roman gods and goddesses, doesn't matter. They came out of a background and lived in a culture where they're just statues, idols everywhere representing all kinds of gods and goddesses. And Paul says, what I'm about to talk about, who I'm about to talk about is not one of them. This is the God. And the one characteristic, the one attribute that Paul hones in on about the God is what? He is rich in mercy. The God is rich in mercy. How rich? Well, everything about God is infinite, right? So every one of God's attributes, no matter which one you're talking about, there's an infinite supply of that. This is the one and only, the true and living God, and he has an infinite supply of mercy, pity, compassion. Now, here's the thing. As I was thinking about this last week, trying to think a little bit of how I would write this letter if God moved me to write this letter. And in one way, it's kind of surprising and ironic that Paul will, in the same lesson, in the same breath, in the same scene, talk about people who are so bad toward this one true God, and then talk about the infinite mercy of that God in the same statement, in the same presentation. You would expect that when you get done with verse 3 and Paul starts talking about God, what attribute of God should he be talking about? The God who is infinite in justice, right? These people mentioned in verses 1 through 3 have earned what? The wages of sin. Eternal death. Cast them out of my presence. The God shouldn't want anything to do with people described like this. And so it's a little bit surprising and kind of ironic that Paul goes to not the justice of God, but he goes to the mercy of God. And why in the world would he do that? What's he trying to say here? What point is he trying to make? Well, Paul says that the God who has this infinite supply of mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, gave us that mercy. He's tying the mercy of God to the wickedness of these people, and he's giving the explanation for why you can look at them in the same sentence. Why this God with infinite mercy would give any of it to these people described over here? Why? It doesn't make any sense. Why would he do that? Because of his great love with which he loved us. There's the explanation. Why be merciful to him? Because he loves them. And the the word he uses for love here is in the past tense, meaning when he came and gave this mercy, he had already loved them. At, At a point in the past, he had already loved them. Not after they saw how bad they were and cleaned themselves up and started living right. Oh, okay, now I'll give you mercy. That would make sense to us, right? But no, before any of that happens, at a point in the past, past from where they were, when it happened, that's when God had loved them. It's like Paul explained about Jacob and Esau. Before the two of them had ever done anything good or bad in life, before the two of them were ever born, what what did Paul say about God? God chose to, to love Jacob. Before he ever created a thing, God chose to love Jacob. That's exactly what he's saying here. Because God, before the foundation of time, chose to love these people even when they were dead in trespasses, he came to them with his great love and gave them mercy. It's an amazing concept. It's it's, it's almost more than you can take in when you start trying to, to process it all. I mean, seeing that they were spiritually dead, seeing that they were living comfortably in the realm of trespasses and sins, seeing that they were under the domination of this world and the prince of the power of the air, seeing 
that they were serving their selfish flesh and that they were angry at him whenever they couldn't get what they wanted for the flesh, seeing that they were disobedient and unrighteous all the time. His love for them and us was so deep that instead of punishing us for the way that we acted in that condition, he pitied us. He felt sorry for us. And he did something incredible to rescue us. What was that? Verse 5. Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. He had such pity, such compassion, not anger, not wrath, not justice. Pity for us in that condition that he made us alive. And so the next blessing on our list up here is regeneration. What does a dead person need more than anything else? Life, right? Without life, dead person can't do anything. What does a spiritually dead person need? Spiritual life. And that's what God gave. That's what God did to his chosen, loved, but spiritually dead people. He gave us the ability to do what is right. He gave us the ability to do what he deserves and what he demands. He gave us the ability to obey, which began with faith. Trust in my son as Lord and Savior. And giving us life to do that, we did that. And it was all by grace. It was all God's gift alone. It was all by God's sovereign choice and work. And Paul says, by grace you have been saved. Saved from what? Saved from what in this context? Death. Spiritual death. Saved from punishment? Yes, no doubt about that. Saved from uh, Satan's power over us? Yes, but here it's the context of spiritual death. No dead person can give themselves life. No dead person can raise themselves back up again. No dead person can start talking again and walking and breathing again. No spiritually dead person can give themselves spiritual life. By God's grace, he saved us from death. He gave us life. And folks, when you, when you let that sink in, you have to end up where Paul has been pushing these readers and us all through this letter so far. Why did God give this blessing? Why did God give that blessing? Why did God do this for us? Why did God do that for us? To the praise of his glory. To the praise of the glory of his grace. And when you really sift through this and, and understand what God did for people who were in that condition, what spiritual death means and what it looks like and, and how it acted toward God. And he loved us so much before creation that in that condition, he had pity on us and he gave us spiritual life. Where else do you end up? But that is glorious grace. That's not normal. That's not common. That's not ordinary. That's not something that we just listen to and then get on, off to lunch and talk about something else. That is glorious grace. That is it's spectacular grace. That is marvelous grace. That is grace that is unlike anyone or anything else in this world. He freely brought to life people who were spiritually dead to see the realm that we were in and hate it and fear it and run to his son by faith for righteousness. This is what he did for us. And how can we end up anywhere else than being full of gratitude and praise to the one who did it who didn't have to do it and to the one through whom he did it, his son, Jesus Christ. Folks, that is the only explanation the only explanation for why we don't live in the realm of trespasses and sins anymore. It's the only explanation for why we don't still follow the course of this world. It's the only explanation for why we're not still dominated by Satan every second of our lives and why we don't give into our flesh all the time. We do once in a while, but we don't do it all the time anymore. Why? Because he freely brought us to life. And so... We live full of gratitude and praise. We now live eager and committed to live as people who are spiritually alive. People who live for him, not for Satan. 
People who live in obedience, not in trespasses. People who follow the Spirit, not the world and our flesh. It's the only explanation, so it's the only result that should come from it. And I'll finish with this. I'll finish where we started. I asked us why, when we share the gospel with people, most of the time, they don't believe. They might listen politely. They might ask some questions But as it turns out, they go about their life and are unaffected by what what we just said to them. No matter how clear we are with the facts, no matter how passionate and urgently we come across to them, they, they go away unaffected. Why? Well, this is why. Unless God makes them alive, what are they? Spiritually dead. What can a dead person do? Nothing. They can't escape the realm of trespasses and sins. They can't even see that they are in that realm or that it's a dangerous place to be or that there are eternal consequences for living in that that realm. They can't see that the things that they desire most are, are really awful, not just awful for them, but awful before God. We need to be praying to him to pity them and make them alive at the very same time. Now, we're going to talk more about this blessing next Sunday. We haven't finished what Paul has to say about it. We'll talk more about it next Sunday. But until then, let me leave you with this. If the evidence proves that you have been made alive, then marvel over that. Marvel over the glory of your regeneration. Not so much how it happened. Paul doesn't get into the nuts and bolts of regeneration and new birth here. It's not so much how it happened, but that it happened. That he did it. And don't cease thanking the Father for doing it. Paul heard about their regeneration, and every time he prayed, he was thanking God without ceasing for that that blessing in their life. Do that for yourself. Pray all the time, and every time you pray, thank God for making you alive spiritually. And then live as someone who is spiritually alive. Someone whose pleasure is now obedience to Christ and submission to the Spirit. Live now consciously and deliberately in that realm for His glory and for your joy. And connected to our theme of this whole study, as the whole congregation does this, not just one saint, or two saints, but as the whole congregation does this, lives as people who are now spiritually alive, that is a church that is being built by God. Not built on anything else. No other characteristic that is most true of us and most obvious of us. But there is a group of people who have been made alive by God and now are living a, a, a living spiritual life for the Jesus Christ and in submission to the Holy Spirit. That would be a congregation that is being built by God, not by men. Let's strive for that. Let's pray. Father, as always, thank you for truth. Uh, We were glad to read John chapter 17 this morning, where Jesus said, asked you, sanctify them with the truth. Your word is truth. That's the way you set people apart. That's how you make saints. That's how you make congregations. You build congregations through the truth. Thank you for using Paul to give us the the naked, bare, honest truth this morning. Don't let us leave here thinking, well, I know that sounds bad, and that was probably true of these these former idolaters, but I'm not that bad. I, I was a pretty good person. I grew up in a Christian family and went to church and was in Sunday school and was in the youth group the whole time, and I never did anything bad. Father, don't let any of us leave here this morning with that impression of ourselves. Father, I pray that the truth that we have read this morning, that we will will come to the conclusion that that is true of us. That is true of me. That's who I was. That's exactly who I was. And I can can testify. I can raise my hand right now and say, there's no better description of Mark Reed before the blessing of regeneration than that. I mean, that just nails me, but it nails every one of your saints. We manifested it a little differently in our own individual lives, but it's all true. Spiritual death is spiritual death. So thank you so much for using Paul to be so clear with the, with the ugliness, with the darkness, so that he could get to verse 4 and bring out the beauty, the purity, 
the truth about you and what you did starting before you ever created a thing, choosing to love us then, knowing exactly what we were going to be, exactly what we were going to do, and then coming to us, breaking into our lives while we were still dead in trespasses, while we were still living that out, coming to us with your pity, your compassion, your mercy, feeling sorry for us, and doing everything we needed to be rescued from that realm of trespasses and sins. Thank you for showing us that this morning. I pray, Father, that that will fill our hearts with joy and gratitude, which will end up bringing glory to you as we live as people who are now spiritually alive, not dead, alive. Father, make that happen that way for that result. And we'll praise you in Christ's name. Amen.